everyone! How's the boy here? And welcome to part two of my Milton Steam Picnic Vlog. So in part one, we were given a tour around the outside of the facility and the various going-ons. Now in part two, we'll be getting a tour by Wayne Fisher, showing off his extensive collection of various machinery. So, without further ado, take it away, Wayne. Hi, my name is Wayne Fisher, and I operate the Ontario Steam Heritage Museum in Pusley, Ontario, just south of Guelph. And this museum, what we do here is we restore steam traction engines and steam locomotives. We take it out to shows and, and uh, exhibit them at the uh, steam shows and the plowing matches. And uh, we also a teaching museum where we teach the course to allow uh, potential operators to get their certificate of qualification in order to be able to run this equipment legally in, in public. And uh, we've got a lot of technical expertise so people when they take our course and they go out and they get the disease and they buy a steam traction engine and they bring it in here and we've got all the tools, equipment and so forth to be able to maintain it and put it back into service. Um, we're also in the business of building a railway line and we're overhauling a locomotive, a uh, 36 inch gauge which was the standard construction gauge used prior to uh, the internal combustion engine and prior to trucks and uh, cars and bulldozers and earth movers. Everything you used to build this country and tie it together was all done with steam, uh, considering the fact that the last spike was driven in November of 1885 to tie Halifax to Vancouver. That was still four years before the invention of the internal combustion engine and 10 years before Rudolf Diesel developed the diesel engine, which replaced all the steam equipment that we have here that we're putting on display. Now we'll go through a tour. Okay, all right everybody, so back in the late 1800s, if you're building a factory and you weren't on a watt on a river where you could have a turbine, you had to build, there was no electrical grid. So back in the 1870s, 1880s, you built yourself a boiler house and you built an engine house. And so this particular engine here was designed in the 1870s. Now in 1905, they built a modern furniture factory up in Chesley, Ontario, called the Krug Brothers Furniture Factory. And this is where this engine came from. So this was installed in 1905. So um, what they did was, so as, as time progressed, okay, so this is a modern furniture factory in 1905. But when you got to the uh, um, 18, 90s, there was a new wonderful invention that was out there that everybody wanted to have. Anybody know what that might be? Electricity. Electric lighting, exactly. So what they did, in, in, in the, starting in the 1890s, if you wanted an electrical generator, they took this engine, they moved the outboard bearing out, and they put in a wooden uh, pulley in there, the little wooden pulley would run an alternator to run your electric lighting. So now guess what? The factories could go from single shift to three shift operation. So so that was, that happened in the 1890s. This particular machine I said was built in 1905 and installed in 1905. Now what you'd do is you had a leather belt that would go around the flywheel. The leather belt would go up onto the ceiling and drive what's called a line shaft. On the line shaft would be all the pulleys and all your machinery was driven with flat leather belts. So you'd line up the machinery below the line shaft and that's how the plant was powered. So that was the way it was done in 1905. Now, let's move down here and we're gonna look at another engine. This big engine here was built in 1925. And you notice it's a compound vertical steam engine, only this time 
we're driving a 60 cycle generator. So this is 20 years after that. So from 1905, that was how you distributed power in a factory in 1905. This is how you distributed power in 1925. Because what happened, what big thing happened in the world between 1905 and 1925? World War I? Right. During World War I, the price of electric motors dropped because the demand was so high. So that when the war ended, you could now buy an engine lathe with its own motor, a drill press, a, a, a milling machine with their own motor. So power was transmitted through wires with electric motors. So in that 20 year time period is when the factories switched from power transmission of the leather belts to power transmission with electric motors. So that's what happened in that time period. Anybody any questions, just stuck up your hand. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down here, we're gonna look at a really big steam engine. This is a 1908 Corliss Cross Compound steam engine and it was purchased by the Grand Trunk Railway which became CNR and it was purchased for their Stratford shop where they overhauled all the locomotives uh, for Ontario and Quebec up in Stratford. Now back in 1908 there was no electrical grid or anything so you had to generate your own power. So they, they, they installed actually two of these machines. And these, this machine is uh, 1600 amps, 220 volt DC, because they needed variable speed back then. And the reason they needed variable speed was to run things such as overhead cranes, because with AC you, you didn't have variable speed. So everybody look at that picture on the wall way up there. That picture on the wall shows the last locomotive that was overhauled in the Stratford shop in, in 1960, November of 1963, that picture was taken. And the next day they announced the closing of the shop because by then they had switched over, they had phased out all the steam locomotive and switched to diesel electric so that shop was no longer necessary. Now, Holding that engine up in the air is a crane that could lift 200 tons. And that's what this machine powered, was the DC to run the overhead cranes in that factory. So this machine ran from around 1908 until the 1960s, powering the overhead cranes in that factory. Now this particular engine, when they announced the closing about two years after that, they arranged for Ontario Hydro, which is our power generating utility in Ontario, had a museum down in Kipling Avenue. And they arranged uh, for Ontario Hydro, they donated this engine to Ontario Hydro for their museum. So it was down in Kipling Avenue, they moved it from that plant down to Kipling Avenue. And then in 1967, does everybody know what happened in 1967? Centennial year. Centennial year. So Ontario Hydro took this engine, took it down to the Canadian National Exhibition, put it up on blocks, and put it on display as their contribution to the centennial year. And I got a picture of the Globe and Mail newspaper, the front page in August the 27th, uh, or something like that, of 1967, showing all the people standing around looking at this big engine. Now in 1968, the president of Ontario Hydro says, what the hell are we doing with the museum? We generate power and distributive power. So they phoned up the Science and Technology Museum up in Ottawa and, and said, would you like our entire collection? So they shipped this engine up in nine pieces along with their beautiful electrical, they had uh, gorgeous electrical equipment uh, and transformers, early DC motors from the 1890s, shipped the whole mess up to, up to uh, Ottawa to the museum 
they shoved it in the warehouse and it didn't see the light of day until I came along. So, so prior to the pandemic, uh, I used to go up to Ottawa and help them sort out their, their uh, uh, steam exhibits and their electrical exhibits. So uh, they started saying, oh, we're closing this one warehouse. Uh, would you, and so they started donating stuff to me and said, would you like this engine? Because we'll never put it on display. We don't even know how to assemble it. So I said, of course. <laughs> so, so anyways, it came down from Ottawa on a three float trucks, weighs 86,000 pounds, and uh, we had to pour 35 cubic meters of high density concrete to support it. And uh, we assembled it in here. We had to put it in a, in a flywheel pit and a generator pit, and uh, we reassembled it. We spent four months remaking re all the parts that they had lost. So this is all assembled now, and, and uh, we've even set all the valves on it. All we would have to do to get it up and running would be to anchor it down with epoxy anchors and, and to find a boiler big enough to run it. Like this would need at least 100 horsepower of boiler capacity to turn this over. Because the high pressure piston in here is 19 inches in diameter. The low pressure piston in the cylinder is 34 inches in diameter and it does 300 strokes a minute. So you can imagine how much steam you need to put in that cylinder because remember in a steam engine we put steam in both ends, right? So take a pile of steam. Now in order to keep the piston square in that cylinder, they have the, the, the uh, piston rod at the front end, and on the back end they put a tail rod on here, riding on a slipper to be able to support the back end to be able to keep that 34 inch diameter piston square inside that cylinder. So that's the story on, on this machine, and uh, I'm sure if I hadn't said yes I'll take it, they'd end up cutting it up for scrap, and that's, this is probably the last known, yeah. that I know of, large cordless cross pump compound steam engine uh, uh, in Canada that's left. So, so we've got probably the one and only. And you'll see the size of this, okay? Now this was 1908, but by the time you got to the 1920s, they didn't fit, build big engines like this anymore. Uh, first of all, by the time you got to the 1920s, you had electrical grids in the cities. And also, uh, if you're generating power, you went to a steam turbine. And a steam turbine is like one-tenth the size of this for the same amount of horsepower. So, uh, this, this technology of building these big steam engines came to a, a real quick halt by the time you got to the end of the uh, uh, First World War. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to move down here a little bit. I'm going to tell you about uh, steamboats. If everybody just wants to lock the gate down here, and then everybody can come up after I get done my little talk here. No. We'll get everybody down here. That's a steam drill. That's a that's pneumatic drill, it's a hard, hard rock drill. Yeah. I talked to a guy who run one of those things, they used to call them wheelie angles. Sometimes he would snap back and hit me in the chest and kill you. Okay, so prior to the 1840s, when you wanted to cross the Atlantic Ocean, you had to go by sailing ship. The average time to cross from London, England, to New York City was eight weeks by sailing ship. That was average, eight weeks. If you wanted to go from New York City to the gold fields in California, it took three months by sailing ship to sail all the way around and come back up. So, communications traveled at the same speed as what the sailing ships uh, traveled at. So in 
1838, there was an engineer by the, the name of Isabard Kingdom Brunel. And there were a lot of little steamboats, a little bigger than this, that would go around the British Isles and would cross the English Channel. And everybody thought that there's no way you could ever build a, vi a, ve a vessel big enough to be able to put enough fuel on board to be able to cross the Atlantic Ocean and have still room for passengers and freight and all that. But this guy was an engineer, so he knew that if he doubled the dimensions of everything, uh, it you'd increase the volume by, by eight. So he built and designed and built the first ship to cross the Atlantic by steam. And it had paddle wheels on the side, and it was called the Great Western. And it, it went into service in 1839, uh, and on its first passage from London to, to Boston, it took 15 days. Big improvement <laughs> over, over uh, yes. um, eight weeks. So a Canadian <laughs> by the name of Samuel Kennard, he was a Canadian, Kennard Ship Lines. Yep, heard of him. You've heard of him? Okay, so he West heard West. about that crossing. So he went down to New York or Boston, <laughs> got on the, sh on the return trip back to England by steamboat, negotiated with the British government to, to, um, um, uh, to get the mail contract to bring the mail across the Atlantic, purchased four steamboats or steamships and started regular scheduled service in 1840. Now, on the, on the, on the, on the sailing ships, they would never leave, the captain wouldn't leave the dock until he had his holes filled with freight and he had every cabin. So you'd go down to the dock, you may wait two weeks before that could happen. And then you're ready to leave, oh, wait a minute, we can't leave yet because the tide's coming in. We gotta wait till the tide's going out and we gotta wait for a little bit of wind. So then, and then away you would go and you, as I said, it took eight weeks. So the, um, uh, You've all heard of the War of 1812, right? Yep. This is where the Americans think they won, but they didn't win. We won and the British won because it was President Madison who dispatched three armies to invade Canada because the British army was tied up fighting Napoleon in, in France. So after the Battle of Waterloo, uh, uh, he had a they had a 15,000 man army that they were gonna bring over here to, to help us little Canadians out. So anyways, that's when the Americans pulled in their horn and, and sued for peace. So, the, so you've, you've all heard that song by Johnny Horton about the Battle of New, New Orleans, uh, where they fought the British, the bloody British in New, in New Orleans. And yeah, and they, they trimmed the, you know, it was a major defeat for the British, eh, in New Orleans. There was only one problem. War over. The war, war was over by eight weeks. But by the time they signed the, uh, the, the, the Declaration of Peace, sailed across, took eight weeks to get across the ocean, and then, oh, we gotta sail around down Florida and get to New Orleans, like it was 10 weeks before the, uh, since the battle had occurred, eh? So that was part of the problem with, uh, uh, because trans, uh, communications went at the same speed as the sailing ships. So in the 1890s, they developed the steam turbine. And, and so uh, with the steam turbine, uh, they end up cutting the, the time down to like seven days, five days to cross, to cross the Atlantic Ocean, eh? What, what, about, what about fuel requirements? Well, uh, they were able to put lots of fuel on board. By the time you got to the 1930s and 40s, they weren't burning coal anymore, they were burning oil. So, so the, one of the fastest crossings was the Queen Mary, you all heard of the Queen Mary. Yep. On its second voyage, it crossed the Atlantic Ocean from, from uh, the Southampton Dock <coughs> to the New York City Dock in three days, 23 hours and 30 minutes. So that's how, compare that to eight weeks, right? <laughs> and, and so uh, that's how, 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 how 
transportation on the ocean unfolded with the application of steam. Eh? And we have here probably one of the finest examples of a steam launch in North America. Now out at the back you probably saw uh, the Frederick Ross out there. That's uh, Judy and I's uh, little steamboat. And so when I go, go boating, uh, most people when they go boating, they go to Esso or Shell and they, with their jerry cans and load up the gasoline and away they go. I back up to my wood pile and, <laughs> and load up some wood and, and I get uh, 38 miles to a face cord of hardwood and I can bunker enough wood to go on board that little vessel to go 50 miles. Who's it named after the week? Uh, the, the Frederick Ross, uh, when we got it, we were going to call it the African Queen. You've all seen that movie mm -hmm. with Humphrey Bogart and yeah. Catherine Hepburn. Well, so so anyway. we, yeah, so we, we joined the International Steamboat Society. In that book, they had a list of all the people that owned steamboats and what their name of their vessel was. Well, uh, there was about seven African queens. So my wife, well, that's not going to do. So we call it the Frederick Ross, which is my middle name and her middle name. Yeah, so that's what they got to the name of that. So anyways, this vessel is owned by a guy by the name of John Coulter, and he's storing it out here. And it's a, a cypress hull and beautiful oak and mahogany inside. And this is an 1890s design. And, and this would be uh, back in the 1890s, before they started putting uh, gasoline engines on boats, the wealthy people would have steam launches like this, and they could hire an engineer to run it. And so you, you see lots of pictures where all the ladies come down with their big, their gowns on and their parasols and they got their wicker picnic basket and they go down and they, they get on board the boat and they, and they steam up the river uh, four or five miles and they moor up there on an island and they lay out the blankets and they have a big picnic up there. Anyways, that's what these launches were used for. And then of course, once they started putting uh, gasoline engines on boats, well then, Everybody forgot about these things and everybody could do it, eh? So there's only about 10 little steam launches in, in Canada and of course we've got two of them out here. So the guy that, so this thing is, is done up so he doesn't have to do a lot of polishing. And it's a, a, a cross compound steam engine and, and, and to get on this you have to take your shoes off and get in your sock feet and all that. So, so the, uh, the, um, the guy that owns this, he says, Wayne, he says, if I ever get another steamboat, he says, I'm going to get one like yours where you can take a wheelbarrow load of firewood, dump it on the deck, steam it up and have some fun rather than <laughs> polishing all day. So anyways, that's, that's the story of that little vessel. So you can all come up and have a look at it inside and then I'm going to tell you one more story over there. Question. Wasn't the Great Western also use a lay the first transatlantic cable? No, that, that was a Great Eastern. That was the third steamship he built. Yeah. Good point that you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, he just mentioned here something that's uh, fairly important. is um, The uh, Isabard Kingdom Brunel, when he built his first steamship called the, the, the Great uh, uh, Western, and then his third steamship that he built was called the Great Eastern. And it was the largest steamship that was ever built since the, uh, um, uh, that lasted for about 30 years. But when the telegraph was invented, uh, where the railways went, the telegraph was invented. So the telegraph, the first telegraph line started being laid in the 1850s. So by the time you got to the 1860s and they wanted to lay the transatlantic telegraph cable, the Great Western, or sorry, the Great Eastern was the only ship big enough to be able to put all that cable on board to cross the Atlantic Ocean. So once, by the time you got to the, the 1870s, there was undersea cables to every, every capital throughout the world and, and the entire world was all connected by telegraph, so we didn't need to wait for the, the, the transition of a, of a steamboat or a sailing ship for communications, it was now instantaneous. So if everybody wants to go have a look at this and then we'll do another little story over here, have to have a look. You want to take a look at it? Just find it. You can see it up yeah. here, right? Yeah. Don't fall. Hurry. Hey, Murray. 
You're not leaving, are you? We're going for a wagon ride. I'm leaving now. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll wait till everybody comes down from up there and then we'll do another one more little talk keep here. Keep walking out. It's a lie. It's a lie. You know, Frankenstein. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's a lie. Get some light bulbs going there. Here, here. Mark. Your Edison light bulbs are working yeah. great. Without reading the washing machine at home, there's always motor sitting on the yeah. Okay, everybody, you want to come on over here? Okay, so one of the things that I want to demonstrate to everybody, if we can get everybody out here, still one person, one straggler. Are you coming? Okay, so one of the things I want to show out here to everybody is, is a typical switchboard and a typical engine house. Before the 19, before 1910, there were no electrical grids in Ontario. So every city, if you had a factory in a city, you had to build a boiler house, as I explained earlier, and put in steam engines and, and generate your own power. The first five sections of this switchboard came out of Timothy Eaton's department store. And back when he built his first department store in the corner of Young Street in Queen in, uh, in the 18, late 1880s, he had a powerhouse there and he had, he had AC gener steam engines running AC generators to run the electric lighting. He had steam engines running DC generators for his elevators and escalators in the building because they had to be variable speed. So he also had a switchboard in there that was 100 feet long. And I says, what in the hell would you need a switchboard 100 feet long for? But what he was doing is he measured the power to every department in his store. And you'll notice on some of the nameplates there, the beauty salon and, and the elevator compartment. Every section of his store, he had a thermal recording meter that record, recorded the power consumption to that department. In addition to that, he owned 20 factories in the buildings around where the Eaton Center is today, where he made everything from horse harnesses to underwear, which he sold in all his department stores across Canada. So uh, what he had to do, so basically, and he metered the power to all these 20 factories. So he was running his own electrical grid before there was electrical grid in downtown Toronto. So, uh, you'll notice the size of these meters up here. How big they are. And, and the reason they're so large is that it wasn't until you got to the late 1890s where you had automatic voltage regulating circuits. So, the engineer running in the powerhouse, once the load started to build up, the voltage would start to drop so you'll see there's a target on there and the needle has a hole in the target. So then the voltage would start to drop. So the engineer in the powerhouse, he'd have to go over to the field rheostat on the AC generator, crank the voltage up, and then when the load started to shed, he had to adjust it back down again. Otherwise, if the voltage stayed high, everybody would burn out their light bulbs, right? So, um, so they had to be able to see these meters and you'll notice that there's light bulbs behind them. Now, I want you to all take a very careful look at that, those light bulbs, because those light bulbs behind those meters are, are reproduction Edison 1890 bamboo filament wow. light bulbs with a bamboo filament in it. And you notice how yellow it is? Not, not harsh glare like the Tungsington lamps that we had when we were growing up, eh? So Edison rated, that is what is called a 16 candle power bulb. Because back in 1890, people didn't know what a watt was or a volt or an amp. So, but if you're living in the country, you're lighting with candles, so you knew what a candle was. So 
They were rated at 16 candle power, but he had another reason for doing that. In, starting in the 1830s in all the big cities in Europe and North America, they started to put in gas lighting. So like Boston, Philadelphia, New York, they laid gas lines and everybody's house would have a gas jet in it and they'd have gas lights. And one of the people that did a tour out here last year uh, lives in an old house in downtown Toronto and her house was plumbed for gas, gas lighting, yeah. So a gas light puts out 16 candle power. So that's why he chose 16 candle power because he knew that when he would go to the cities, that was who his big competitor was because it was an established, it started in the 1830s and this was 1890, so it was an established utility and that's who his big competition was going to be. So by the time he got to the 1890s, there was basically 14 different companies that made incandescent light bulbs in North America. As when you're an electrical manufacturer back then, you had to make your own generators, you had to make your own light bulbs, you had to make your own sockets, you had to make your own, you had to make everything, okay? That's why some places they had 60 cycle, other places 25 cycle, other, and Chicago had 133 cycles, and Hamilton had 66 and two thirds cycles, and it was all over the map. It was whatever the electric, and then some people had DC, such as Edison. It was whatever people uh, were familiar with the designers. They had no idea that it would ever become one big electrical grid later on. Like uh, Westinghouse picked 60 cycle, which is what we end up getting today. The Siemens brothers in Europe picked 50 cycles, which is why they got 50 cycles in Europe. So, so Edison, uh, uh, the cost of a light bulb in 1890 was the equivalent of a tradesman's daily wage. You had to work a whole day to buy a light bulb. But it's a big improvement of having gas jets and open flames. So the average house, you might only have two or three light bulbs, and when you're ready to go to bed, you turn the light bulb off, right? Because you, you only got maybe a thousand hours of a light bulb. So there were three big three big major manufacturers. There was Edison General Electric. He had 45% of the light bulb market. There was George Westinghouse. He had 25% of the market. And there was another company called Thompson Houston. He had 25% of the market. So Edison says to his, his hardware stores that we're gonna sell his light bulb, because you go to a city, you might have three, two, three, even four different companies generating electrical power and they'd share poles and this guy would have DC on the pole, the other guy would have AC and it was a heck of a mess. So anyways, Edison went to his hardware store and said, okay, I got 45% of the market. If you're gonna sell light bulbs, you're gonna sell my light bulb only. You're not gonna sell a Thompson Houston, you're not gonna sell a Westinghouse one. But if somebody comes in, you can give them an adapter. So the guy comes in with his light bulb and he's got a Thompson Houston light bulb which he's gonna pay a day's pay to buy, to replace. Do you have one of these Thompson Houston bulbs? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I, I can't sell you one of those. I'll sell you an Edison uh, uh, bulb and I will give you an adapter. Oh, okay, so he takes his Edison bulb home, he takes his adapter and he threads it in the Thompson Houston socket. But Edison was a crafty guy. He put a ratchet mechanism in it. So you threaded it in, you can't get it back out. Now you had to buy Edison bulbs. <laughs> so anyway, that's the story on that. Wow. <laughs> so, so then what happened was uh, Westinghouse got into, a, the Thompson Houston company got merged with, with Edison General Electric to become General Electric. And, and so then the, the, the Edison socket then uh, now had like about 70% uh, of the market. And then in 1890s, Westinghouse made an agreement with General Electric. So uh, part of the agreement was that Westinghouse could use the Edison base socket. So that's why we got the Edison socket today in North America. That's how it all unfolded. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, so the patent dates on all this stuff in here is like 1880s into the early 1890s. And you'll notice that it's all open on slate, eh? And is what they mounted on. And you could also buy these boards on marble if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, 
uh, it's all open and you can touch any component on there and not get a shock because they were running what's called an ungrounded system. Whereas today, uh, Ontario Hydro and all the utilities, they run a grounded system. So you got a, a ground in your house. So if you touch any wire, you got a path through you and you can get a shock. But uh, back in those days, as long as you didn't touch two of them, you were all right. You could touch one. Okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. I know it's, there's a museum in England that has all the light bulbs, and they got like 10,000 light bulbs. Oh, yeah. Because of different bayonet sockets. Yeah, sockets. everybody was, made their own thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I go to Quibble and say light orange. Huh? <laughs> say I go to Quibble and say light orange. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. It is. Oh, so I don't. Okay, this is the circuit breaker. Yeah, but what's the material? Sure. That's that is carbon. Carbon. And, and That's here nice. again, these guys were smart. Okay. The current flows through this shunt. This is where the current flows all through oh. there. Okay. And they put carbon tips on it, so. When you close the breaker, and this, you gotta have power on the other side so it locks in because you're generating your own power, okay? So when you open the breaker, the arc comes on the carbon tips here, and so this is what burns away. So all you have to do is replace the carbon tips, and the actual shunts that carry the power, yeah, aren't affected, yeah. You replace a cheaper thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Oh, neat. Yeah, that's how they do it. Oh, oh, well, there's, there's a big flaw in you. Was that? Well, that's where their gen that's where their museum was. It's a big transformer station, but they had oh. room in there to put their museum in. I, I remember seeing. It's the, not there now. I, I see the big transformer station. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, still just, there. Just north of Horner Avenue. Yeah, yeah. Oh, one time yeah. we had a big blackout yeah. there. Cause, yeah. Cause yeah, you can't lock that in because because you have there's a solenoid in there. If you're running your own power plant, okay, and. Uh, let's say Saturday night comes if, if you're the Eaton store, well, everything's shut down other than your window lighting, right? So, so uh, <clears throat> when you shut your generators off, the breakers open automatically, okay? Because when you restart the generator, it's not like a circuit breaker in a house or something like today, where you close the circuit breaker and it stays closed because we've got an electrical grid. But when you're generating your own power, uh, what you've got to do is you've got to start your generator up and get it up to get it up to full voltage and then you can close the breaker otherwise if you try to start the generators up and all these are all closed you won't you won't get a circuit to you know you'll stall out the engine or you, you won't get it up to full capacity yeah so so you got to get your generator up generating full voltage then you can come and close the circuit breakers and energize all the circuits okay Wayne, yeah uh, can you explain that machine Okay, this, this is an Edison uh, DC bipolar DC motor or DC generator. And I've got another one in the house that's a little smaller than that. And it's the 540th one that Thomas Edison built. This one is a little bit later and it was made at the General Electric plant up in, in um, uh, Peterborough in Canada. So this is a Canadian made uh, uh, um, bipolar generator. Now this technology only had a very brief period of time. It started about 1875 uh, is when Edison came up with the idea of the two coils like this and it ran until about 1905 or 19 somewhere in that area because then then the evolution of the DC motor they put the coils inside and, and uh, the coils weren't sticking out here, the coils were inside of the frame. And so this was the very first DC motors and DC generators that were in production. Cool. Very rare, there's, prob there's probably not a not hundred left in North America anymore, mm -hmm. if that. And we're fortunate enough to have two, but it took us a long time to get them. <laughs> Thank you. Wayne, did you ever see the movie Chernobyl? 
There's a six part series. You'd find it fascinating. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. how they screwed up in terms of the load on, right. the, on the reactor. Yeah, and all yeah. That. And, so then, and then they couldn't cut it down that, properly. That, yeah. That, that, that. yeah. Like here's the latest following the bipolar one is this one where they put the coil in the middle of the frame. So that was the next transition. And then the final transition is the way it is done today with the DC coils in, inside the frame. So that's the three different stages of the DC motor development. Nowadays when they're making electric motors, they don't even have electric coils on the outside. They're putting in permanent magnets because they can now make magnets that are real big with uh, uh, that are permanent magnets so you don't need a, a, a field coil in them anymore. What's wrong? Romy, Romy, did they put a ring on the back of the picture? Oh, no. Um, okay, so. Good, you're here. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is a 1912 Nichols and Shepard steam traction engine built in Battle Creek, Michigan. And this one's my favorite engine. My wife calls it the ugly engine. But anyways, in 19... Yeah, yeah. It's not as pretty as hers. Is that the one that we were just on? Yeah, that's oh. Judy's engine. Oh. You notice, didn't have my name on it. And Judy's engine. Oh, I didn't see your name on it. Oh, yeah, I gave her that for a wedding present. Mm. And she says, nothing says I love you like a steam traction engine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, this is a 1912 Nicholson Shepard. And this is what we call a Western plowing engine. So anywhere from 65 to 85 horsepower, you can pull an eight bottom plow. And it was engines like this that opened up the Canadian prairies and the American prairies. So the American the Canadian prairies, 90% of it was all open with steam traction engines. It wasn't open with a horse. With a horse or an ox, you can plow an acre in a day. At the end of the day, the animals wore out, your wore out, you would have walked four and a half miles to plow an acre. And so if you had a 30 acre field, that was a whole month to plow, right? Once they brought these babies out, starting in the 1870s, a machine of this size would plow between 25 and 30 acres in 10 hours. And of course the farmers, uh, like they are today, you don't work at the end of 10 hours, you work till the sun goes down, right? So, but anyways, a machine of this size pulling an eight bottom plow, you're gonna plow 25 to 30 acres depending on how heavy the soil is. Yeah, Sorry, and like man. today, the manufacturers build uh, steam traction engines in the next in different horsepower categories. The next category above this was 110 horsepower. It would uh, pull a 14 bottom plow and plow anywhere from 50 to 60 acres in 10 hours. What would, be the, what would be the width on those on those furrows or those? Uh, those would be uh, uh, probably about uh, uh, twelve inches into a depth of about eight inches, something okay, like that. Just yeah, okay. yeah, what yeah. The, what did you call it? A bottom plow? Yeah, that's what the number that of furrows. Mean? What's a furrow right here? Well, that's the that's the plow that's itself. The uh, <laughs> if you're plowing with a horse, it's a single furrow plow, right? You get one little. Oh, yeah, you get one little okay. furrow, right? But with these, each pass you got eight. Oh, okay, yeah. and the big 110s horsepower, you'd get 14. But the Case Company, which manufactured over half of all the steam traction engines in North America, at the peak, at, they made a total from 1870 to 1920, they made over 32,000 steam traction engines. <laughs> so they weren't happy with that. So they built a 150 horsepower steam traction engine. It would pull 52 bottoms. That many more? 52 bottoms and plow 160 acres in 10 hours and in four days a square mile. That was in 1907. We don't build a diesel tractor that would do that even today. And, and of course, it's engines like this 
It was this one actually broke virgin soil in Dolphin, Manitoba in 1912. And of course, the first plow in the ground, that's the toughest plowing because you got all the roots and twigs and all that sort of thing in, in the ground. But, but the, uh, uh, and that was one of the things that once they started developing gas tractors and they could have two or three or four furrows behind them, that's what the salesman for the gas tractor told me. said, oh, we don't need any of these big machines anymore because all the virgin soil has been broken, eh? And they can get by with the little ones now. So, anyways, that's... And, and the reason for, for this is, like I said, that this would pull uh, an eight-bottom plow with 85 horsepower. If you want to pull an eight-bottom plow with a diesel tractor, you need about 150 horsepower. So you'd think that electrical horsepower, steam horsepower, mechan uh, diesel horsepower is all the same, but it's not, and it's not because of the torque curve. On a on a on a gasoline engine or a diesel engine, you put the pedal to the metal, and and you, you let out the clutch, and if the load is too heavy, your engine will stall, right? And if you can pick the load up, the torque curve on an internal combustion engine drops off like this. But on a steam engine, it's the other way around. When you open the throttle valve, the torque curve rises and you've got full torque at almost zero RPM because you're putting steam at full pressure in both ends of the piston and on a, on a diesel engine only one stroke out of the four is a power stroke. On a steam engine, every stroke is a power stroke. So, because of the torque, it's a 2.2 is the actual ratio uh, for replaces. So if you've got a ship and you've got a thousand horsepower steam engine in it and you want to replace it with a diesel engine, you've got to put in a 2250 horsepower diesel engine so that that hull will give you the same speed and the same uh, operating characteristics as what a thousand did uh, uh, on a steam engine. So. That's the ratio between the two. And that's why you have gotta use like 150, 160 horsepower diesel to do what this one would do. The wood goes in. Yeah, the wood goes in there, and that's the firebox end, and then there's tubes in there. And how much room is in there, quite a bit? Yeah, this one I can put a stick of wood in there, 50 inches long, or over four feet long in there. Oh, it gobbles up the wood. So it goes way up to the front? It's, it's, about, it's about that deep, the firebox in this one. On Judy's engine, the firebox is about that deep. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and then, and then the, so you the like flame. The fire inside? Yeah, you light the fire in there, and then the, the smoke and the gases pass through the tubes, which are surrounded by water in the barrel, and then, and then the smoke goes up the smokestack. And the steam engine is one of the first pieces of equipment with automatic control because a guy by the name of George Stevenson in England who built the very first railway and he built some of the very, the first successful locomotives, he came up with the idea that when you exhaust the steam out of the steam engine, you take it and you put it through a venturi and you blow it up the smokestack. And what happens is by doing that, that makes negative pressure in the firebox. It, and, and so what happens is, the harder you work the engine, the more fuel you can, if you got a, like a big oak log on the sawmill, the harder you work the engine, the, the, the draft increases, so the air pressure inside the firebox is lower, so more oxygen rushes in to, to, to replace the, and, and to replace the steam. Uh, generation so so the harder you work it the more air rushes in when you back off on the load then the, the air the air drops off so it's like an automatic draft control in order to be able to to uh, uh, so the, the harder you work the engine the more air will rush in to make the fuel burn harder to replace this to replace the steam that you're using hmm. so in this building we can start up eight uh, Total of eight traction engines, and Does we have. This one go up? Like, do you use this one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, we we just got the safety valve back from the calibration shop, 
So this will be at the Steam Air Show. This has been at the, every Steam Air Show for the last 15 years, this guy. Okay. Yeah. And so... Do you do two or not? Do you do rides on this one or no? Uh, we can pull the people when we were this one too. Oh, okay. oh yeah. 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 Sometimes we do. Just that Judy's engine is a lot smaller and it's more easier to maneuver and to work and, yeah. and it's easier to climb up. And so you taught her how to do all that driving? Oh yeah, she's right? a certified operator. Oh, so is my daughter Sherry. That, oh, that was your daughter? Yeah, that was my daughter oh, and my wife. I yeah. didn't realize. I knew it was your, your wife, but I didn't yeah. realize it was your daughter. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're both certified operators. Last time we came, the dogs were there. Like, mm. Remember we came with Clinton? Oh yeah, 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 yeah we put the dogs away for the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, that's the Nichols and Shepard engine. And this engine here is a 19, uh, 19 Sawyer Massey made in Hamilton. Oh, in Hamilton? And, yeah, and same with Judy's engine, it was made, made in Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah, oh. and, uh, uh, and the Sawyer Massey, the Massey name is part of the Massey family, you know, Massey Ferguson and yeah. Massey Harrison, yeah. same family, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and there was a, a Massey that was president of, of Sawyer Massey from a certain time period in there. But so, uh, this company started about the 1870s uh, and they made traction engines uh, and uh, right up to the 1920s and then they made other equipment, they made gas tractors and so on and they went out of business in the 1920s. 58. Did, did but they, this is probably the finest steam traction engine in North America. Did they work in, was there Massey Ferguson in Brantford? Yeah, Massey Ferguson's yeah. combine plant yeah, was in Brantford. Yeah, I, I worked yeah. there yeah. and yeah. fixed the engineering yeah. machines way yeah. back before they had printing machine, uh, uh, copiers. Oh, right. That was my job yeah. there. Every, oh, yeah. Every week I was there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and white farm equipment. Yeah, white was there too and they yeah. made combines in, in Brantford. Yeah. Hi, Sean. Yeah. Are you joining the tour? No, I was or are you just finding your way out? Oh, I'm not hiding yet. I'm not going out. But oh. Just making one trip, so it's one less trip. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what we'll do is put it down here. I'll be back. This is cool. What's this one? That's really neat. That's a little, that's a little marine boiler. Oh, that's uh, really That's cool. uh, Andrew Webb, who was running that steam engine out there, the big Waterloo out there. That's his. He just finished restoring that book. Two weeks ago. The water goes in? Yep, the water goes in there and then the water level is shown on the glass here. Does okay. the lid come off and then you put water inside of it? Uh, no, you put the water in through through an injector which is on here. Same as the steam engines got there, you suck the water out of the tank and the injectors will pump the water into the boiler. And then once the water gets hot, what do you well, use? Well, it gets, it gets up to about that level, yes. and then you start the fire, and there's a firebox in there, yes. and then this whole compartment from here up to there is the steam compartment, and that's where the steam will build the pressure up. What is it for? Oh, this would this would be for a small steamboat like the one out the back there. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's a little marine steam vertical steam boiler. That's beautiful. Right? Yeah. How many horse that you got? Oh, that, that would be something in the neighborhood of about five horsepower. Yeah, nice okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice yeah that's a little bit smaller than one on on uh, the Frederick Ross down there. Uh, our boiler is about eight horsepower. Oh, okay. With a five horsepower oh, engine, that means you got room to, to blow the steam whistle. Yeah. See, a lot of these people, they build their little steamboats, and the and the boiler is the same size as the engine, and you got no steam left over to blow the whistles. <laughs> it's kind of an important safety device. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll go down here. This is a neat little engine here. This is out of a Clark steam car. Now, this is a typical design. There'd usually be a sprocket on here with a chain drive down to your differential gear onto your, onto your car. So, probably never heard of a Clark steam car, but in the United States, by the time you got to about 1904, there was more steam cars on the road than there were gas and electric combined. And the reason for that is steam was a familiar thing. So the mechanics understood steam, but they didn't understand the internal combustion engine yet. So in the United States, there was 125 companies Oh. building steam cars and in Canada we had about three or four companies building steam cars yeah 
And then what that brought that to an end, so the gasoline engine, uh, one of the big problems with the gas engine was that you had to crank it by hand. And so there was a, a guy by the name of Charles Kettering, and he was the chief engineer of Cadillac. And a friend of his was starting a car up, and the thing backfired on him, and, 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 he, and he broke his wrist. And the, you've heard lots of stories of guys trying to get their tractor started, and they bang their shins and all this. Because they go like this, and then it... Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so he says, oh, there's got to be a better way. So he invented the electric starter. And the first car to have an electric starter was the 1912 Cadillac. And once the electric starters started being put in, in cars, now anybody could run it. You know, businessmen, you didn't have to be... Originally, the first cars, you had to be sort of a bit of a mechanic to be able to make them run, eh? But uh, once you have the electric starter, now ladies could start them up, just turn the key and away you went, right? Whereas before, there was a bit of a to-do to get the damn thing running. So, the, the development of the electric starter on the gasoline engine is what brought an end to the steam cars and, and the gasoline engine took over from there. So, on the wall you see lots of patterns up there. Now, back in 1870s and, and right up to the 1920s, Electric welding hadn't been developed yet, so they had four things to work with to build a steam traction engine. The first thing is they could roll plate and rivet it together. The next thing they could do is they could make a casting with a, from a pattern and then machine it. The third thing they could do is they could bolt it together. And the fourth thing they could do is they could put tubes in and roll the tubes in, because the tubes you have to replace, that's the first thing that goes in a boiler, right? So you had four things to work with. So we can do all these things today. But, but think about the antique car people that have a, 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 a 30 or 40 year old car, like a 76 Chevrolet or something like that. And it's got that computer chip in there that controls the firing of it, of the engine. You can be the best mechanic in the world, but if that thing is crapped out on you, you're not going to fix it, you're not going to make it go, eh? Whereas the earlier ones, you can diddle with the distributor and the carburetor, and you can always make the damn thing go, right? But with this new electronic crap in there, you're beat. So we'll be able to keep these things going in perpetuity because we can still do all those basic things. So, okay, let's go into the main workshop. And here's a good idea of what we do out here. That's the uh, eight furrow plow is what open 90% of the, of the um, Canadian and American prairies. Okay. Yeah, that's a cultivator. And that's got a whole pile of, yeah, that's after you plow, then you cultivate with a cultivator, right? And that smooths, the, smooths out these, these furrows you got. Yeah. Kevin Fadd had one of, the, one of the original cultivators that yeah. went to uh, King Paving. Oh yeah. Years ago, they, yeah. they bought it from him. Oh yeah. Yeah. Kevin's always tried to get back to oh. right? I don't think that they're yeah. going to let us know. Yeah. yeah, see that's a 110 horsepower case, that one there. That's the next classification up. So that could pull a 14 bottom plow. Where this case, this case engine here is only about 75 Is this horsepower. yours? Yeah, yeah, that's down in the field down there, yeah. Then we plow with it every now and then. So out here is our main workshop. That's one of the movies we made. We supply equipment to the movie industry. Oh yeah, yeah, that was for one of the movies and our guys got in it. And that's uh, Kevin's engine uh, right that he was running today. That's his engine. And down there is, is our, our uh, road roller, which is up in the other building there where the food was. And we supplied a portable engine for them. And yeah. Where was that? Uh, that was shot in, uh, that is behind the Kingston City Hall. On Kingston. Sunday, yeah, oh. yeah. After the market is cleared up Friday night, 
uh, the, the farmer's market in, in Kingston. They rented it out and they set up this whole set and they shot the set and tear it all down for, for uh, uh, by Sunday evening. And so by Monday morning, it's all clear off and back to a parking lot again. Yeah, and this one is signed by Del Toro, the, the famous uh, movie producer. Yeah. Nico Del Toro. He won the Oscar for The Shape of Water two years ago. Okay, I don't know who he is. And he, he's a, he's a, a, a Canadian producer. This particular mm -hmm. movie was called Haunted Peaks. Oh. Yeah. Haunted Peaks. Yeah. So it's on TV it, now. Yeah. Is it on like DVD or something that you can rent? Well, I, I guess oh, you can. I don't know. Okay. But are anyways. Yours, yeah, yeah. yeah that that's one? the steam up boat here. Oh, that was a picture oh, yeah. somebody gave me from. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, this is the steam up boat here. We had on, on Christmas Day or the day before Christmas or something. It was colder than hell. Look, we got all the parkers on. <laughs> oh, oh, the dogs are here. Oh yeah, oh, they left the dogs out there. Hi, Louie. Two years, anyhow. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so this Hi, is our Jay. main workshop. We've got an overhead crane here. We've got a milling machine and big lathes and small lathes. And we make most of our own parts here because you can't go to the, can't go back to Sawyer Massey or Case and say, I want to spare this or spare that because a lot of these companies aren't around anymore. What's the other one's name? Uh, this one is Max. Max is the hunter and the killer, and Louis the the, the uh, alpha dog, but he's uh, nice and mellow. I remember you were saying that before. Yeah. Yes, I know. I know. Are you coming? Oh, you got train lights. Yeah. So this is our 1909 Vulcan locomotive, which we're rebuilding, uh, and we stripped it right down to the frame, and uh, uh, the uh, we just set the boiler on it just recently. We're getting it ready to get assembled here, and uh, on the back end goes the wooden cab. Is that's this on the fire? The fire yeah, that's the firebox in there. Yep. Yeah. And uh, then you have the tubes along here, and then the smokestack will be up there. And uh, on there is the, up in that steam dome is the throttle. So this is what we call a tank engine. And the water tank, which you'll see is over here, sits on top of it. And, and inside the cab, you'll have a box with your coal or your wood, okay? Because you don't go very far with these. Mm -hmm. okay. What these were used for was the construction industry prior to bulldozers and earth movers. So if you're building something in 1890, well, nobody had thought of a truck yet, but, you know, and, and the gasoline engine was only invented in 1889, so some of the cars that were out were in their infancy. So if you're building anything, you want to do any work, you bought a tank locomotive like this, and 90% of the railways that are in existence today were all built before 1900. Now when you go across a railway crossing and you look down the railway crossing and you see how nice and symmetrical it is, if there's a little valley there, it's nice and symmetrical, and up on the top is the, uh, is the railway tracks. Or if you drive through a railway underpass, okay? And as you go through, you look down and you see it all nice straight hill down there, same way down the other side. How they, how they did that, uh, and this applies to all of North America, what they did was when you came to a little valley, they built a little stick trestle. And, and they laid 36 inch gauge track panels and they brought in on the, on the main line a railway mounted local a steam shovel and they run a spur line into where there was uh, some material that they could get and they run a little track panel over to that and they have a little locomotive like this and it have six dump cars behind it and a steam shovel would load the six cars up and then this little locomotive would go down maybe a half mile or a mile down the track and then back over the 
over the little trestle and they dumped the fill in. And they worked their way all the way across the valley. And that's how all these, that's how this whole country was built, was with steam. Because back in 1990s, they, nobody had thought of a dump truck yet. Nobody had thought of a bulldozer or an earth mover. All you had was steam. And the last spike to join Halifax to Vancouver was driven in November of 1885. That was four years before the casting engine came out. And, and uh, basically the entire country was tied together with steam locomotives, steam cranes, steam shovels, all mounted on rails, and little tank locomotives that built this whole country. And that's why 90% of narrow gauge stuff was 36 inch gauge uh, for construction locomotives. Now the contractor that built the line from 12 to, uh, tell he's back in his engine. The, the contractor that built the railway line from Guelph to Godridge, he bought five of them at the start of the program. And that's how we filled in all those little valleys all the way along. That's the story on that. That's a, that's a dump car. Yeah, and it was little cars like that that this would tow. Yeah. And so they took that over my hand they dumped the fill off the side and they fill the whole thing up. And I got photographs of railway building projects back in the 1890s and they're filling in trestles that were over 100 feet high. And they just keep dumping the fill in and they level it all out and then they let the little trestle drop inside. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now the guy that owns that. Is it right now? No. Uh, that came here a bunch of years ago. Uh, one of the volunteers out here has got a, a locomotive that he's sending to California, 36 inch gauge, that he's uh, rebuilding. And so it came from the Yukon. And this, the, 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 in 1906, the Detroit Yukon Mining Company purchased four little uh, HK Porter locomotives. They're about half the size of this locomotive and they purchased 24 dump cars. And they used it up there in, in 1906 and seven, and then it was abandoned. And so this fellow that got the locomotive found this back in the bush, negotiated with Parks Canada, rented a helicopter, and they flew this thing out of the bush to the Trans-Canada Highway and trucked her back here, and he's restored it. So we'll have one, one uh, car to haul behind our locomotive. <laughs> And, and you see this little jigger up here? The yellow thing? This yellow thing, yeah. That's called a jigger. And how they did railway maintenance, but nowadays the, you can buy pickup trucks and dump trucks with, with railway wheels underneath them that are hydraulically sent down. But back prior to that, prior to the 1960s, they used jiggers. So uh, this thing can actually be lifted off the track so we, what we've done is we've re-gauged this from the standard four foot eight and a half gauge, or sorry, four foot eight and a half inches gauge to our, our 36 inch gauge. So we had to bring the wheels in and shorten the axles and all the brakes and all that. So we've just got that up and running now. So, so we're gonna use that little jigger and we built a service car and, and, and in front of it, we're gonna put the service car and we're gonna put all the tie plates, fish plates, and bolts and spikes and our tools on the little car and then as our railway line advances we'll just keep pushing it along and at the end of the day we'll just have a little jigger bring it back in open the doors and park it inside anyway so uh to go down here that's a portable a water loop portable So starting in the 1830s, they started bringing out portable engines like this. So it doesn't drive itself. You've got a, 
a steam engine on the top, you got a locomotive boiler, and you got steel wheels, and you'd bring it out into the field, and you'd hook it up to the separator. The separator for thrashing was invented in 1800. So, uh, so once you got into the 1820s, people started experimenting, and they built the so they'd bring these locomotive uh, portables out, hook them up with a leather belt, same as they were running the Baker fan there, to run the separator. Well, it worked really good. So then they started building bigger and bigger portables till they got to be this size. And pretty soon you'd need six and eight horses to pull the thing out into the field. So the farmers say, like, why can't it drive itself? So in the 18, late 1850s and early 1860s, a guy by the name of Thomas Avery invented, basically there were three things to be able to change the portable into a traction engine. The first thing was the differential gear on the back end to allow you to go around the corner under power. And of course the automobile industry was able to use that because all the patents had expired. Eh? So the differential gear, the clutch. The clutch wasn't invented for the car in the, in the 1890s. The clutch was invented in the 1860s for the steam traction engines and the steering gear. So once they had those three things, then they, so by the time you got to 1870, the traction engine, as you see it out there in the yards today running around, it was a mature design in 1870, and that was still 19 years before the internal combustion engine was invented. So all the mechanical technology that was developed for the steam traction engine allowed the automobile industry to be built, like the clutch, the differential gear, piston cylinders, all that sort of stuff, axles, steering gear. That was all developed in the 1860s. So, yeah. So that's sort of the history of that. This bay here is a 1915 Sawyer Massey, the same size as my wife's engine, only it's got the original boiler on it. And when we got it here, we looked at the serial number on it, and it was five numbers below my wife's engine. That's a locomotive whistle. That's beautiful. Yeah, so it was in the same production run in Hamilton in 1915. So why does this one have? Oh, we put rubber on rubber so we on can. It and those ones don't. Well, because this one we can't run on the roads because we tear the pavement all up. So we have Judy's engine and this engine, so we can go in parades and all that sort of thing. Otherwise, we'd damage all the asphalt and the roads department would be after us. So we put rubber on these ones so we can take them on. Why do some of them have roofs and some of them don't? Well, it was an option, just like when you buy a car today, you can buy them with to keep the heat off. Actually, yeah. It can be really, really hot in the summer, and, and with a roof on it, you always get a little bit of a natural breeze comes through there to keep you cool. And of course, keep the rain off. So now I, I told you about the portables, and then when they developed the steam traction engine, they called it a steam traction engine. So then in, in uh, around the early 19, 18, uh, or around 1900, they started putting these hit and miss engines and gas engines to make, uh, put them in to compete against the traction engines. So they called those, gas truck engine. And then in 1902, the employees of the Hart Car Company coined the word tractor. So the things we see running around in the field today, we call them tractors. Those things out there we still call steam traction engines. And the portables pulled by horses, we call them portables. What's that? Besides the coconut? Uh, not sure. Oh. Well, oh, that's a planer, I think. 
Oh, that's, that's a wood planer. Yeah. 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 So now you know what a, a steam traction engine is, and a got and a tractor, and a portable. So this looks like a steam traction engine, but guess what? It's not. This is called a road locomotive, and this is a 1903 road locomotive. Now in 1903, cars were just starting to be made, but nobody had thought of a truck yet. But if you had, let's say you had 20 wagon loads of crushed stone that you wanted to haul from a quarry 10 miles across town to build a road, how the hell did you get it there? Well, you could use a horse and some wagons, but that would take you forever. So you brought in a road locomotive. And this thing would hook up to 20 wagon loads of stone and tow it all across town. Or let's say you had some big machinery that arrived at the railway station and you had to get it across town to a factory. This is how you'd, you'd use a road locomotive. And there's pictures of these moving uh, grain elevators out west. Or if you want to move a house, this is what you use them for. Oh, okay. So this is a 1903 Port Huron. The wheels are seven feet in diameter. And, and the, uh, 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 I've got, it's called a, 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 a double tandem compound. So I got two high pressure cylinders and two low pressure cylinders. I've got a and, new friend. And, a, and what we call Longfellow boiler. What? I've got a new friend. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, very, very friendly. So that's a road locomotive. These are other traction engines out here that are owned by the various uh, volunteers out here. We, take, we put on a course to get your steam traction certificate qualification to allow you to write the exam. And so the, the guys take our course and they write the exam and they get their their certificate qualification in the mail, and then they run out and buy a traction engine. And like this guy bought bought his, and and uh, about four weeks after he took the course, he had this thing. Well, what do I do with it? Well, we bring it out here and we help him fix it up and get it running. We can't and, afford that. <laughs> yeah, and, and the same with this one. Uh, that was bought by a volunteer and brought out here to work on, and and they all got their own stories with them, and mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Just wait. Oh, so you learned something. Good. We nope, came with, I think we came with Clinton a few years ago. Yeah. When we did the thing there. Well, we've probably got a few more things. And then there's the big locomotive crane out in the yard out there that you parked by. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you have it running yet? I don't uh, we I haven't don't... had it running here, but it is runnable. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just have got a little bit more assembly work to do on it. And there's some little wee tiny cracks around the smoke box but not in the pressure vessel part so, we so this is what you do all day yeah we just play mm -hmm. around with here your okay you're all we set have to go back yep. that way peter okay your engine's in and put to bed and yeah, doors locked up Chris, and are you going yes, that way? andrew's okay out there he's just putting his away we gotta go back around the wood pile okay okay thanks kevin we'll see you later okay we you gotta go back you. that way yeah okay yeah. go ahead peter I'll follow you. As long as they can remember, I always wanted to see you on the big... Oh, Wayne, you're killing me! <laughs> and so that was the show, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. I Once again, a huge thank you to everyone who put on the show. It was a fantastic event, and a particular thank you for Wayne showing off his extensive collection and allowing me to film it. So, yeah. All around a great day. Now, as far as these Vlogs go, I don't know if I'm going to do them as a regular thing. Probably not, but who knows. If the opportunity arises, I might do another one in the future, but we'll see. Anyway, for right now, I have been Hazardboy, and you guys have a great one. Take care, folks. <laughs>